Hi, so welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Insura Premium. If this is the first time you are joining or watching my video, thank you for clicking on the video. Remember that on this channel, we have lecture videos on various subjects, on various topics relating to ACCA UK, ICAG Ghana, uh, ICANN uh, Nigeria, SIMA UK, and other uh, contents relating to uh, first degree, HND, MBA, MSc in accounting and finance, and various other contents that will assist you in order for you to prepare well for your examination. In this video, I want to share with you the key topics that you have to focus on in order for you to pass the advanced taxation examination. Now, so the advanced audit uh, paper, it's a paper that is going to be purely written going to be writing English throughout. So there are a number of things that you have to be mindful on, uh, mindful about or pay attention to as you go into the exam hall. Number one is going to be your handwriting. Very, very, very critical. Very, very critical because here you're going to be writing throughout 99.9% .9 of the time. You're going to just be writing, even though there are computation aspects that you have to or you may do about materiality. If you are doing uh, analytical procedures, you may have to do some computations. 99.9% .9 of the time, you are writing, you are writing English, you are writing English, you are writing English throughout. But a question we ask ourselves is, okay, so how can we then sail through? So like I said, number one, you need to work on your English, work on your grammar, work on your handwriting. Very, very important. Very, very important. If you have a horrible handwriting, better work yourself out a little before you go into the exam hall because clarity, legibility, and uh, preciseness is very critical as you go into the exam hall. Your grammar has to be on point at this level. This is a level three paper for Christ's sake. And so... Uh, uh, you need to make sure that you need you, you write in a manner that you are expected to uh, write because you are a professional accountant going there. Just that, unfortunately, the chief examiner has raised concern uh, that sometimes students write as though they have never been or they've never had a tertiary education, and that is really heartbreaking. Sometimes when you read that from the chief examiner or you hear that from the chief examiner, because I mean, many of you coming into the AC, the ICAG paper are either first degree holders or some of you even have your masters, MBAs, MSc, and all the men coming in but then uh, why is it that people have problem at this level because this level the game is different the playing field is different the strategy is different so please make sure that you work on your grammar very well you work on your handwriting very well then presentation is very critical at this level Okay, presentation is very critical at this level. So you want to make sure that you are presenting your solution in a more logical manner that will increase your chances of passing the examination. If not, you're going to screw it up and you're going to fail the exams at the end of the day. So you want to make sure you deal with that very, very well. So what are the key topics we're going to focus on to pass the examination? Number one is ethical issues. As auditors, one of the critical things we need to understand is ethics. So the code of ethics, the professional code of ethics, uh, the threats to the code of ethics, you must make sure you understand them very well before you go into the exam hall. Okay? You must make sure you understand them very well before you go into the exam hall. Because minimum of 10 mark question waiting for us on ethics. Okay, so you have to understand the fundamental codes of ethics, integrity, objectivity, professional competence and due care, professional behavior, confidentiality. You must make sure you understand these uh, very well as you go into the exam hall. Then the threat to the code of ethics, the self-interest threat, the self-review threat, the advocacy threat, the intimidation threat, and then the familiarity threat. Then you have to also understand the appropriate courses of action that a professional auditor or the accountant must take in order to ensure that he or she does not breach the code of ethics. As a professional accountant, you must ensure that Every decision you make, every transaction you are involved in, every contract or assignment you are engaging, you, are, you insist that you are adhering to the code of ethics and you are going to be independent on the assignment. So anything that will, be, that will compromise your independence, that will compromise your objectivity, that will compromise your integrity as an auditor, you must make sure you stay away from it. But then there are appropriate causes of action generally that we can talk about that is reminding or educating uh, the person involved whether to, uh, for the right thing to be done then uh, you have to be mindful of the fact that now this is from the perspective of the auditor 
Okay, this is from the perspective of you, the audit firm. Then also, you have to be mindful of the fact that um, you don't do anything that brings shame to the profession. In other words, you carry out procedures that will ensure that you are obtaining sufficient and appropriate what's audit evidence. So ethics is going to be very critical here. It's going to be very critical. So make sure that you understand the issues relating to ethics. The second thing is going to be quality control. Quality control. Um, quality control is very critical whether we are doing a traditional audit or we are undertaking a non, whether we are dealing with uh, an assurance engagement or a non assurance engagement. Quality control is very critical. And so there are what we call the elements of quality control as per the International Quality Control Standard 1. And we put the element up as HALEM, uh, human. Uh, resource acceptance and continuous uh, thing in, in that case then we'll talk about the uh, rights and uh, responsibility t then we talk about ethics we talk about leadership we talk about monitoring in that case so you must understand the various elements of quality control and how an audit firm can put in place those quality control measures to ensure that the engagement remember the audit firm as a whole must have a quality control in place but then the quality control of each assignment is the responsibility of the engagement partner. So the engagement partner must ensure that each engagement is undertaken in line with what quality, ethical issues are followed, that uh, resources are allocated in a manner that is expected, and that audit evidence is gathered appropriately in that manner. So quality control is going to be one another, one another uh, bedrock topic that we need to be familiarized or we need to familiarize ourselves with as we go into the the exam hall. Then the third thing is going to be acceptance of engagement. One way or the other, the examiner is going to be bringing us something about factors we take into consideration before acceptance of engagement. And this is where audit planning and risk assessment joins in. One way or the other, we must understand risk assessment. Now remember that when it comes to risks, there are about three things generally that you have to understand about risks. We have what we refer to as the business risks. We have what we refer to as the audit risks, we have what we refer to as the risks of material misstatement. Now, the business risks is where we have issues in relation to strategic risks, finance risks, uh, issues in relation to uh, uh, compliance risks, operational risks. Then we have uh, the audit risks. The audit risks is the risks that the auditor may issue an inappropriate audit opinion after the audit. And there are three things that, made up the, that make up the audit risks. That is the inherent risks, the control risks, and then the detection risks. Note that the auditor has no control over inherent risks and control risks because inherent and control risks adds together to give us the risks of material misstatement. The risks that the uh, financial statement will be materially misstated or there may be errors in the financial statement. The auditor has no control over that. It is management responsibility to design effect, effective and efficient internal controls in order to prevent, detect, and correct fraud and errors when they exist. However, the only thing the auditor has control over is the detection risks. And there are two sources or uh, ways through which detection risks arises, and that is from sampling risks and non-sampling risks. Sampling risks because the auditor does not undertake 100% or carry out procedures on all events, all items. The auditor is going to just take a sample and then uh, carry out procedures on the sample, and that sample then represents the population, and the auditor is going to reach a conclusion. So the only way the auditor can reduce the sampling risks to an acceptably low level is by increasing the sample size and also by using the computer-aided accounting techniques. That way, the auditor can identify unusual transactions, unusual balances in the account, and that will help the auditor to reduce the sampling risks to an acceptably low level. Then we have the non-sampling risks. These are risks that comes in because the auditor uses an inappropriate uh, procedure or the auditor misinterprets an audit evidence. So you must understand the various issues that relates to that, and that is the idea about audit risks. So the examiner may give us scenarios and we must understand what kind of risks are these, what procedures do we undertake as auditors at the end of the day. So audit planning, risk assessment, very critical, very important, an area that we have to be on the lookout for. Then certainly audit procedures and audit evidence. There is a question waiting for us in the exam hall on audit procedures and audit evidence. Whether you like it or not, there is a question waiting for you in the exam hall on audit procedures and audit evidence. Now, as to which 
how which area is it you must know about it please know that when it comes to audit procedures primarily they are the analytical procedures inspection of documents observation uh recalculation and reperformance and then inquiry of management these are the five vowel sounds a e i o u analytical procedures inquiry of management inquiry uh, inspection of documents observation Recalculation and reperformance, A E I O U. So at the back of your mind, note that anytime they say undertake audit procedures, you must have these at the back of your mind. But the context of the question will determine the kind of points you are going to be producing at the end of the day. Let me give you an example. Let's say that we are auditing trade receivables. What are the procedures we undertake on trade receivables? Certainly, we must carry out analytical procedures. That is by uh, comparing the trade receivables in the statement of financial position current year to the previous year then over the years so that we can identify some trend and some unusual balances in the trade receivables then number two we may have to make some inquiry from management whether they have made any provision for bad debts relating to the trade receivables and then if there are some unusual balances in the account we may have to send out what external secularization to those uh, debtors to confirm whether the figures are actually in existence or whether the entity will actually get those money at the end of the day so we must make an inquiry and that is the issue there then sometimes we would have to make uh, inspect a couple of documents we need to inspect the uh, 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 sales uh, day book we need to inspect the uh, various uh, cash book to find out whether in the uh, subsequent uh, events whether whether uh, at between the year end and uh, by the time we issue our auditors report whether this data has made certain payments and so has it been reflected in the cash book that is inspection at the end of the day i, ho I hope you make you get a point so depending on what you are auditing and the kind of procedures that you are what, undertaking let me say this, that when it comes to carrying out the audit procedures, you need to be mindful of the accession also being tested. Now, there are various accessions that can be tested. We have accessions for the account balances at the end of the year. Okay, Here, we'll be looking at issues like existence. We'll be looking at issues like rights and obligation. We'll be looking at issues such as valuation. Okay, This is account balances at the end of the year. Then we'll be looking at the transaction or event. Those are other accessions. This is where we are looking at accuracy. We are looking at completeness. We are looking at cutoff. We are looking at classification. Okay, we, we are looking at maybe comparability. These are accessions that we test for events and transactions that occur during the year. So when you are, the examiner says, what procedure do you undertake? The first question you need to ask yourself is, what accession are we testing? So it, like the trade receivables I mentioned, is balance existing at the end of the year? That is why we have to test for existence. That is why we have to test for completeness. That is why we have to test for uh, um, um, accuracy. That is why we have to uh, test for the issue about its valuation at the end of the day. So that is account balances at the end of the year. Then if the uh, examiner asks us to look at issues about um, uh, tr uh, revenue, then we are looking at transaction and events. So with the revenue, we must find out, is it complete? Does it include all the revenue that must be included? Number two, with the revenue, we need to ask ourselves, um, is it the revenue relating to the current year and the review cutoff? With the revenue, has it been classified properly at the end of the day? So you must understand the accession being tested before you carry out your audit procedure. And always in the question, there will be a clue as to whether you are testing year-ended balances or you are testing transactions and events. And then the scenario, the context of the question will guide you on what exactly you are supposed to do. But what we know is whether you like it or not, there is a question on audit procedures waiting for you some way, somehow. Then you come to the audit evidence because as you are carrying out the procedures, you are gathering evidence. So with the audit evidence, we, we must gather sufficient appropriate audit evidence. Sufficient means we must gather enough evidence to reach a reasonable conclusion. Appropriate simply means we must gather relevant and reliable evidence. Relevant and reliable evidence. So audit evidence is going to be very critical as well in that case. So ethics, critical, you must know that. Quality control, critical, you must know that. Issue about um, audit planning and risk assessment, acceptance of engagement, you must know about that. 
all its procedures and all its evidence, you must know about that very well because there is a question waiting for you in the exam hall. Then right after that, we come to public sector audit or auditing in the public sector. There is a question minimum, uh, maybe give and take 15-20% uh, will be in the exam or for public sector audit. And so you must understand the various issues that must uh, be known when it comes to public sector auditing. Uh, issues about types of auditing in the public sector. We have the compliance audit, we have the financial audit, we have the fi uh, performance audit. You must know the circumstances under which each of these types of audits are carried out and then the guiding principles on carrying out these uh, uh, procedures or these engagements. Then also dealing with the role of the public accounts committee, the audit committee, the internal audit agency, the internal audit unit, dealing with uh, the issue uh, about the Auditor General's report and some concerns raised on the Auditor General report, then outsourcing of public sector audit, the factors we have to take into consideration before the acceptance of engagement from a public sector entity, you must make sure you understand these very, very well. Now, let me give you a clue that there are certain things that are in the private sector audits that are applicable in the public sector audits. So when you're learning, you make sure that you're able to draw those lines there, but we know that the examiner is going to be bringing some questions relating to public sector audits. Then the, the, the last key part uh, of the syllabus is going to be reporting. Reporting. There is definitely going to be something about the audit report at the end of the day or reporting. So be mindful of issues about subsequent events, auditing of subsequent events, very, very critical. Goodwill, very, very critical. Make sure that you are aware of that. Then other information, like why does the auditor reviews the board minutes, the director's reports, the management accountant's uh, reports? Why do we review these documents? Because we want to find out consistency of evidence with other evidence that we have obtained in that regard. Then also modification of the auditor's report at the end of the day. When there is a transaction, how does that influence the auditor's report at the end of the day? Uh, remember, if the thing is material and pervasive, then we are going to be issuing a, disclaim uh, a disclaimer opinion or probably we will issue a diverse opinion at the end of the day. If the thing is material but not pervasive, then we will issue a qualified opinion at the end of the day. Now, when we say it's pervasive, it means it affects the whole financial statement. When we say material and not pervasive, meaning that even though it's material, it's significant, it doesn't affect the entire financial statement. So when it comes to reporting, the auditor's reports, the modification of the auditor's report, reports, various scenarios and how they affect the auditor's reports, you must make sure you understand that very well because certainly there is a question that the examiner is going to be throwing at us in the exam hall that you need to be aware of in that case. So that is also another thing that we need to understand. In addition to all these, it's also some fundamental topics like money laundering. Money laundering. It's, it's, it's an area that is uh, critical also here. I mean, uh, we need to understand the various activities, various uh, ideas that are involved in money laundering, the auditor's responsibilities when it comes to money laundering. And then finally, the issue about um, auditor's liability. Auditor's liability. Uh, it's, it's an area that is really not that broad, so you can spend some time to read that uh, carefully and how the audit firm actually reduces their liability through... Uh, professional indemnity insurance through incorporation, through limited uh, partnership, through the issuance of uh, disclaimer at the end of the day so that uh, whatever reports they issue, they add a disclaimer to it so that if you rely on it and it goes south, we are not going to be responsible at the end of the day. But then for an auditor to be liable, there has to be a duty of care through proximity. And you must make sure you understand all of those principles very, very well as you go into the exam hall. So when it comes to advanced audit and assurance, these are the key issues, these are the key areas that you have to focus on in order for you to position yourself to pass the examination. Like I mentioned, this is going to be a written comment, written comment, English grammar area. So you want to make sure that you are precise in your writing, you go straight to the point, you avoid digression, make sure you read a question very well to understand what the question is requesting you to do, what the question is asking you to do, and most importantly, write your answers in the manner that you are expected 
to write your answers. Let me say that when the examiner says get ready to stop work, I know 99.9% .9 of the time you're not going to do this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. When the examiner says get ready to stop work or the invigilator says get ready to stop work, you want to drop your pen. Okay? Drop your pen. I know you're not going to do it, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So you drop your pen and then you read over the things that you have done. This is a written paper. Sometimes in your brain, under pressure, uh, in your brain you think you are writing, the auditor should send a secularization to the receivables uh, to uh, confirm the amount outstanding at the end of the year. That is what you think you are writing, but another thing has reproduced or has been written in your book that is totally opposite what you thought you were writing. So it is very important to read over your work, go through your work, and find out whether what you wanted to say is actually what has been said or has been written in your paper. And that is going to be very critical and play a key role for you to pass the examination and most importantly, become successful. So if you want to pass audit and assurance, advanced audit and assurance, I believe these are the key issues that you have to focus on in order for you to position yourself to pass the examination. If you do these, I can guarantee you, you go out there and uh, pass the exams. I'll see you in another broadcast. Bye.